And, and so uh, as we open our Bible, we are going to be uh, at Jericho. Jericho lies north east of Jerusalem. It's probably about 15 miles northeast of Jerusalem. It's about five miles from the Jordan River, about five miles north of the Dead Sea. You didn't need to know that, but I thought I would just go ahead and just share it with you and tell you that anyway. So if you got your Bible, turn and let me uh, pick up the story here. So we're going to be looking at the story of two blind men. Uh, yesterday when Sheila and I, we, when we have our time of talk and, and prayer and all, she decided to add three blind mice. And I said, no, two blind men. That's what we're looking on, you know, the, the nursery rhyme. Well, anyway, uh, so we're, we're going to pick up our story here. Um, and, I, and I would say this as we start to read. This is probably Friday before the cross. So we're in Jericho. Uh, the ultimate goal is for Christ to make it to Jerusalem uh, in time for celebrating the Passover. He obviously is not going to travel on the Sabbath, uh, you know, the distance that we're talking about. So it's either Thursday or the Friday, the week before the cross that we're looking at here. Um, Christ has left Galilee for the last time. He'll not be going back up to Galilee. He has probably traveled along the uh, east or western shore of the Jordan River. He's gone down the western shore of the Jordan. And then somewhere around uh, north of the Dead Sea area, he would have crossed over. Uh, perhaps the way of crossing over, would have, and I'm trying to think of the word, what do you call it when you have the little boat that you go across, you can take your car across and all, what's it called? A ferry. A ferry, yeah. Something like that probably would enable him to be able to cross over. And there is a great crowd that is traveling with him, so he's not alone at all. In fact, most likely on this last journey to Jerusalem, he has with him not only his disciples, we know for a fact that his aunt, Salome, is with them because she has asked that her sons, James and John, be able to sit on the right and the left-hand side of Christ when he's in his kingdom. And so we know that his aunt is in the entourage with the disciples. And if his aunt is there, guess who else is probably there? Mary, his mother. Probably his siblings. And we know from the scriptures that his brothers, his half-brother and his half-sisters born of Joseph probably did not, uh, uh, well, they, there's no doubt, they did not know, believe that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. In fact, they were numbered among those that said, perform a miracle and we'll believe you. So they were still to this point, within a week of the cross, they still have rejected that Christ, the son of Mary, the only begotten son of God, is actually the Messiah. Now, the disciples, however, believe that Christ is the Messiah, but they're looking for a Messiah that will be the king. And so as they're making their way to Jericho, and then up to Jerusalem, the anticipation of the disciples is that Christ is going to storm with his powers Jerusalem and he will become king. Therefore, there is still, even in this passage here, a debate between the disciples about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. So this passion and desire for greatness and fame and fortune and success is very much a part of the dynamics of this group. So you have your Bible there. Here we go. Let's pick it up. Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to just start right in at verse 29. And so we read, and as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Now, I've already discussed with you where Jericho is. Uh, I discussed with you some of the members of the crowd. Let me give you one more thing that uh, would be good to know. Uh, Jericho 
was the first city that Israel conquered when they crossed uh, the Jordan River into the Promised Land. Do you remember that? Now, I've been at the site of ancient Jericho, and they have been excavating that ancient city all the way down to the walls that would have collapsed uh, when, Jer when Joshua and Israel were charging, lay in siege to Jericho. And uh, they say we weren't allowed to go down into the pit, the archaeological area, but they said that you can still smell the, the burnt wood that has been preserved by the, uh, the soil over the centuries and the fact that the desert is very dry, that you can still smell the, the fires that would have consumed some of Jericho, that, that the smell is there once they start unearthing, you can actually smell the fires of all the way back to the time of Joshua. So pretty fascinating. Also in uh, Jericho, there's a Palestinian population there. And uh, I can remember as we're getting near the city, it's about noontime. And uh, I can remember Muslims in the road bowing down toward Mecca. So there, there's a mix. So you have the, the Jewish population there, but you very much have an Arabic population who are Muslim there as well. And then uh, also, why is Jericho is actually in the middle of the desert? So why is a city in the middle of the desert? And the answer is that there is a spring that is there. To this day, there is a spring of water that comes out of the mountain in Jericho. All the hills around Jericho are limestone. And uh, so you, you're actually in a valley area. You can look up. You can see the hillsides that are all around there. And, uh, and then there is a place where there is still water that is coming out. And the, the city of Jericho still uses the water that is coming out of that ancient spring. So Jericho is believed to be, if not the oldest city in the world, numbered among the oldest cities of the world because of the existence of the oasis that is there. Now, uh, any thoughts or any questions from any of you? I know that's probably more than you needed to know today, but I thought I would share it with you. All right, here we go. Let's go through Jericho a little bit. Now, the Jericho that we're reading about here was a bustling city. This is not built on the site of ancient Jericho. Ancient Jericho was never rebuilt. And uh, in fact, when you go and visit Jericho today, it's really nothing but a tourist trap. There's really nothing that is there. And so ancient Jericho, this Jericho here now, is a different Jericho than the one in the days of Joshua. It was absolutely destroyed. But uh, as you go through Jericho, it would have been a, a pretty busy village. Part of that is it's on the main road going to Jerusalem. And uh, I remember riding a bus uh, down to Jericho and then taking the bus going back up to Jerusalem. And uh, winding roads is very, uh, very desolate area even to this day. And so we pick it up here then. And as they, that is this crowd that is uh, following Christ, as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Now, the second thing, the crowd, the crowd that was accompanying him. And uh, I've already discussed that. It is in verse 29. And so I'm going to keep moving. All right, keep moving. Here we go. Now, here's the encounter with two blind men. All right. And behold, Matthew 20 and verse 30. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, they cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Now, I'm going to keep moving because I want to talk about blindness. Um, blindness is, is somewhat rare today. I, I, I am so glad that I live in a day that I have uh, glasses and, and as my eyes have gotten older. I, I had uh, bifocals and then I had progressive glasses. 
But if I had lived in the day when they didn't have glasses, I don't know if I would have been numbered among the blind, but I certainly wouldn't have been going out on the hunt to bring something home to eat because anything I would be hunting would be blurred in my sight. So blindness, though, was common in the Middle East in this day. What is interesting is that there is a, a plant that was said to grow in the area that had uh, medicinal uses for the eye. As a result of that, it's believed that there was quite a population of blind people that had made their way to this area of Jericho, hoping that the medicinal plant that was growing there might would help them with covering their eyesight. Then add another thing, what would cause blindness? What would cause blindness? Give me some ideas. What would have caused blindness in that day or in our day even? Huh? Infection. Infection. Absolutely. What else? What? The sun. The sun particularly, uh, and those of us living in Florida, right, we know a lot about the intensity of the sun. Uh, probably any, anyone that has been outside a lot, like Bill Frame golfing or, or Cal Cooper golfing, or I don't know if Dan does, but you're out in the sun a lot. Eventually, you're probably going to end up with what? Cataracts, right? And I could say, how many of us had cataract surgery? I haven't yet. Uh, last time I had my eyes checked, the, the nurse said, uh, you're getting there, you're getting there. But anyway, we'll see. Uh, so yeah, uh, the sun, the sand, sand would get in your eye, it would cause an infection. Uh, uh, vitamins, right? Uh, and I, I have a doctor and a nurse here. What's the vitamin is it that you need for eyesight? Is it D? Huh? Vitamin A? Okay. I can remember years ago uh, visiting in Mexico and uh, blindness in the 80s there was somewhat common. I remember a, a little boy coming up and his eyes were, were just uh, unusual. It had an unusual look to them. And I, I asked the missionary, I said, you know, what's wrong with his eyes? And he said, well, uh, they have a deficit of vitamin in their diet here. So I guess it would have been vitamin A. And as a result of that, this little boy was almost already blind, even though he's probably not more than 10 years of age. So the condition of blindness then, it was common. And then there's another thing I wanted to bring to your attention is that there's a difference in the count. Uh, if you want to take your Bible and you can turn and let me get a swig of water here. Uh, Luke chapter 18 and Mark chapter 10, uh, I think both of those mention uh, only one blind man. Let me see if I have it in my notes. Yeah, Luke chapter 18 and verse 35 says, a certain blind man, singular, one. And then Mark chapter 10 and verse 46 we read, and they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, blind, who remembers the name of the blind man in Jericho? Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And so as you look at Luke and you look at Mark, we have one blind man. As we look at Matthew chapter 20 and verse 31, we actually have two blind men. So here's the question. Is there an error in the scriptures or can we, do we have a, a simple explanation of why on one hand, there's a focus on one, and on another, there's two that are mentioned. You know? Bartimaeus could have been more the aggressive one. All right. Bartimaeus, in fact, Bartimaeus may not only have, obviously, had his eyesight given to him, but there's a, a, a thought, kind of a tradition, that Bartimaeus may have been one of the uh, key leaders in the early church. Now, the reason for that you're going to see is that he and the other blind men actually follow Christ 
after this story. So uh, that's another possibility. The, the thought, though, with this is realize that each of the uh, writers of the scripture here, uh, though the Holy Spirit is directing in the things that are written, nevertheless, they write from their perspective. And so uh, Mark is writing from his, Luke is from his, he's the physician, and then, of course, Matthew, uh, one of the disciples. And so there's not a conflict in the scripture, it's just that the, the focus of Luke and Mark was one, particularly the one that is named, Bartimaeus, whereas Matthew makes a note and says, well, there were actually two that were listed here. So I wanted to make that as, as a point too. Sometimes you end up with naysayers and they, they try to say, well, here's an error. And usually what they call our errors are very easily explained. Now, let me look at the cry of the blind men, the cry of the blind men. And I can't remember, I think I have the verses up here. So I'm going to keep going. Here we go. Uh, Matthew 20, verse 30 and 31. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside. And when they heard that Jesus passed by, they cried out. Literally, they shrieked. They, they uh, were yelling. They became very obnoxious, but they, the, the, the picture here is of one of continually yelling. They just wouldn't be quiet. So they're, they're calling and seeking the attention of Christ. And they're saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Now, let me make a comment about Lord and son of David. The comment about Lord is they recognize and acknowledge Christ's authority. That's the first. By saying he's the son of David, they're saying he's of what? Of royal lineage. Therefore, here are these two blind men, though they may have never before met Christ. Their knowledge of Christ is he has authority. And number two, he also is of David's lineage, of a royal lineage. Of course, both of those are necessary for the Messiah. And then looking at verse 31. And the multitude rebuked the blind men. Because they should, uh, because they should hold their peace. Uh, but they cried the more. Louder and louder. Saying have mercy on us. O Lord thou son of David. Let's fill in the blanks a little bit. Uh, first of all they cried out. And I've already mentioned they're shrieking. It's a, it's a loud continual cry. It's a desperate cry. It's a cry that says this is maybe my last opportunity to have my eyesight restored. So they're doing everything they can as blind men to be noticed. The second is they appealed for mercy and compassion. I've already explained the names there. So I'm going to keep moving. Thirdly, they cried for mercy because they believed Jesus uh, could heal them. So the reputation of Christ and his miracles has reached these blind men in Jericho. But we've already got an idea of the crowd's attitude regarding Christ. And that's going to take me to the callousness of the crowd. Matthew 20, verse 31. And the multitude rebuked them because they should, uh, because they should hold their peace. Uh, in other words, they should shut up. Uh, now, the reason for this might be, and most likely is, that blindness carried a certain, how should I say, uh, judgment of others. People, other people had a judgment about why you're blind. What is it? In the past, like in the book of John. Right, in the book of John. Uh, there's a blind man sitting in the temple. He's 40 years old, I think, 40 years old, been waiting and waiting. And the disciples look at the blind man and they said to Christ, who hath sinned, him or his parents? And so these blind men in Jericho, rather than getting sympathy, is just the opposite. They're despised. They're detested. And by the way, they are beggars. Uh, they have no means of support. And so most likely, if they have any family at all, the family has put them by the wayside, by the roadside, and they have one responsibility. If you're going to eat, 
you need to beg. And so they, they've spent their life. We don't know the cause of their blindness, but we do know they are in a desperate situation. They don't have social programs. They are absolutely dependent upon the charity of others. Let me take you further. And so the crowd's response was basically to shut up. Uh, a, a, a callousness, a rejection of them. Number two, the crowd's rebuke. It was harsh and insensitive. They are desperate. This is their one opportunity to be healed. And they are not going to be quiet. Thirdly, the blind men's reaction. They cried the more. Uh, Suffering, and here we started the class off with prayer for people that are suffering. And there's a, 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 a lot of a concept in our culture today that medicine's always going to have the answer, right? Uh, take a pill and it'll make you feel better. But it may not take care of the problem. It might just dull the pain. And, um, but when you come to the point that appeal is not enough, what do you do? We should do as believers what we should have done to begin with, and that is to cry out the more, to pray. Um, we ought always to pray, right? Galatians 6, 2, we should bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, we should never apologize for seeking the prayers of others. Neither should we hesitate to show others love and compassion. Here, here's a question for you. Any of us here ever been at a point in our life that things are desperate? Yeah, you want, want to share or you want me yeah, to keep no, moving? I, I, think, I think I can. The, the one thing that comes to my mind is uh, when I knew that my first wife was going to divorce me, um, I, I was at the point where I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, the thoughts were running rampant as far as I can't go on. But I can honestly say the Lord was preeminent in where he led me at that very moment to my next door neighbor's house who was a devout Christian. It was at that moment I got on on my knees on her living room floor and I came wow. to accept the Lord as Savior. But when, when I tell you, that was probably the most desperate and most emotional I think of because I didn't know which way I was heading. I mean, it could have gone. I was gonna so in, in the moment of your, your desperation, you not only sought help, but you accepted Christ as Savior. The, come to the place where I had to except that I was a sinner. I needed to repent of that sin. Now, yeah, it, the consequences were there. There's always with sin, yeah. there's consequences. But you know what? I had my Savior to give me comfort. I didn't have that 10 minutes prior. All right. But I've had it since, and I have to praise the Lord for that. Yeah. Uh, what are some things... Well, go ahead, John. Uh, I was just going to say mine was different than his. When I had my car accident, it was the most humbling thing that you can't trust yourself, you can't get up out of a chair, you can't, yep. you can't do anything. It's like I cried, I don't want to be an invalid, Lord. Yeah, I went back in life. Yep. I remember visiting you at your house not long after that. But John had a horrendous accident and uh, years ago, I think Camaro, wasn't it? Like almost brand new. And he's driving between post offices late at night and, and uh, had a horrendous accident. Somebody else. You know, things that will bring us to our knees, uh, accidents, family trauma, uh, children. Children will bring you to your knees. If you're not there yet, you'll get there. Uh, uh, sickness. Uh, financial calamity. Uh, the other things, I, I'm probably overlooking things. But here's, here's the thing. I, I believe is sometimes as believers, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I almost feel like sometimes we feel like as believers we, ha we need to be super people. That we, we are afraid for anyone to see a, a, 
um, a, a, a nick in our arm or where you know, we want to rise above. We don't, if somebody says, how are you doing? And we're afraid to say, I'm hurting or I'm fearful. I'm broken. But those are all realities of life, aren't they? And, and, and we shouldn't be that way. Uh, is it pride? I don't know. I don't know what rises within us that as a believer, we don't want to confess that we're not super strong. Yeah. I think as we get older, we realize, I mean, I realize if, if being super in anything, super dependent. Super dependent. Yeah, that's on a good the Lord, one. because I, I can't do it on my own. Yeah. I mean, the, whether it's the physical limitations or, you know, issues of everyday life. It's just, if, if I'm not more dependent upon the Lord and His instruction and praying for wisdom every day, because if I don't do that, I'm gone. Yeah. Uh, it's, I, 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 I like I, what I, he said. He said, as you get older, you realize you're not super. You become super dependent. I think that's a, that's a, that's a great phrase, isn't it? A word of wisdom from you today, Goober. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Let me keep going. The curiosity of the Savior. Let me point this out real fast. Matthew 20, verse 32. And Jesus stood still and he called them. I thought that was interesting because he would have already heard them in his omniscience. He would have already known they're there. But it was only as they continually called upon him that he stopped. And I think that's a great lesson for us is let's not grow weary of calling on the Lord to answer our prayers. And so it was in the midst of calling and calling and calling and crying out louder and louder. And the people telling them, would you please be quiet? And finally, the Lord stood still. Number two, and then he called them and said, what will ye that I shall do unto you? Uh, we won't have time to look at this, but when he addresses Bartimaeus, uh, he asks the same question. And it says of Bartimaeus, he threw his coat off, the outer coat, and he ran to Christ. And you can picture this blind man trying to get to Christ. That's what he's trying to do. And so that is the picture here. And so what will ye, uh, will ye that I should do unto you? Uh, here's Luke 18 and verse 40. In fact, it might be what I was just saying. And commanded him to, brought, uh, to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And then Mark, Mark chapter 10, verse 46 and 47, looking at these synoptic gospels, the parallel. They came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, blind Martimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And so it was those continual calls that the Lord stopped, and he stood still. And then uh, the compassion of the Savior for your outline. They said, Say unto him, Lord, that, that our eyes may be opened. So Matthew now picks up the two blind men. And so we read in verse 34, and so Jesus had compassion on them, and he touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Now, here's a, a couple of thoughts here. One is compassion or mercy. You can put mercy and compassion, I think, in the blank there. But another thought is that he touched their eyes. Here's a question. Did he have to touch their eyes to heal them? No. So why did he touch their eyes? Huh? So that people could see what was going on. Was right. It, 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 was, it was an act of love and affection. Um, one of the things I, I learned early in ministry, going into the hospital where someone is hurting, they're ailing, they're suffering, maybe even dying, is how much touch is appreciated and needed. Uh, I don't, you know, sometimes uh, people are in so much pain that a, a comforting touch means a lot to them. It's, uh, and, uh, 
you know, some of you might have more insight, but the sensors and the nerves and, and all, there's a, there's a certain healing in not only words of compassion, but in a touch. And so in this, uh, there's the physical movement of Christ toward the blind man. And then uh, I wanted to give you a greater miracle. There's a greater miracle in today's passage than the restoration of physical sight. And it's summed up in this, they followed him. I, I find that very interesting, don't you? Um, they didn't go home. They didn't go to tell their friends. Their heart's desire was to follow him. Uh, remind you, the maniac of Gadara. Remember when he was healed and the, and the demons were cast out? And uh, the people of the city came out and they found the man sitting clothed and in his right mind. And as the Lord was getting ready to depart with his disciples, that uh, maniac who had been purged of the demons, his desire was to go with Christ. And you remember what Christ said to him? No, go home and tell your family. So different, different aspects, different times, different miracles. And then I want to close with this. Luke chapter 19, and uh, we've got five minutes. We take your Bible, turn with me to Luke 19. And there's one more uh, blind man that I haven't told you about. And his name is Zacchaeus. He's not physically blind, he's spiritually blind. And so let's pick up the story here. Luke chapter 19 and verse 1. Jesus entered and he passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a, a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief or the head among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he ran before and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, to see Jesus, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him. And he said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. This is where I have the opinion that this is Thursday and Friday he'll travel to Jerusalem. But that's just my opinion. Uh, verse 6. And Zacchaeus made haste. He came down. Received Jesus joyfully. Rejoicing. And when they saw it. They all murmured saying. That he was gone to be a guest. With a man that is what? A sinner. Now remember the cultural attitude. Towards the blind men. Is that they were probably blind because of either their sin or the sins of their parents. And now we are dealing now with Zacchaeus, this very wealthy man. Verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and he said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. He's a Jewish man. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, with that said, I am going to close. Comments, insight, words of wisdom. Anybody? What have we learned today? We've learned that uh, a, a cry to the Lord is one that ultimately will grab his attention. It doesn't mean that my repeated calls for him uh, are to get his attention, but it does mean that he invites us to pray and cry out again and again and again. And the Lord says, and what would you have me to do to you? And he says, give me sight, give me sight. So let us not be ashamed of asking other people to pray for us. Even if it's Every time we're around them. What can I do for you? Pray for me. Right? Anyway, Carissa? Praise the Lord, Lord. It's a consistent God. You know, say today, yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't matter if he's here on earth or in heaven. We can ask him freely of anything as long as we believe and he'll help us through it. Asking by faith, believing, and he will do it. But we have to ask also submitting our will to his will. Like Christ said in the garden, not my will but thine be done. And what do we do at that point? We absolutely surrender to his will in that act of faith.